So in the eight year period of time, I spent two years as a medical oncology fellow here at UCSF. And while I was a second year fellow, I uh, obtained a master's degree in epidemiology and biostatistics. I spent two years at the Uganda Cancer Institute studying Kaposi's C sarcoma, doing my own SAS programming, and trying to figure out how to do clinical research. I spent two years as what my parents call a real doctor, as a community oncologist taking care of patients. And then I spent two years learning from some of the greats in traditional cancer chemotherapy at Bristol Myers Squibb about what an IND and an NDA actually meant. Regulatory science, thinking about working with the Food and Drug Administration, writing a product label, drug safety. So again, in retrospect, and I didn't realize this when I moved back to San Francisco to work at Genentech, I would submit that I had had a fantastic experience getting ready to be an expert in translational science. And that wasn't purposeful. That was accidental. Um, but uh, they do say that uh, something about a prepared mind. Uh, so in my talk today, I'd like to speak about the future of translational research at UCSF. And I tell that story um, about my journey to Genentech in the hopes that it might make you think a little bit about at UCSF, what do we need to do to make more individuals prepared to make that kind of a difference and to be experts at an area that is somewhat hard to put your fingers on. What does it take to prepare uh, people to be experts in translational research? So in order to do this justice, I want to take a look back at my experience in product development in oncology and talk about a problem statement that I think we have. But let's start out with the good news. So um, I would submit um, two things. First of all, that the finish line, not the finish line, but the goal in product development should be Food and Drug Administration approval. And I know there are people who think getting a product into clinical trials or moving into phase two or moving into phase three can be or should be a goal. But my goal has always been uh, FDA approval and commercialization of a product because I think that that allows for a product to get to the greatest number of patients and potentially have the greatest good for society. So if you um, will just accept that that definition is reasonable, if that's your goal, then, then I would say that the years between 1997 and 2001 was one of the most amazing times in oncology that I've seen in my life. Then I want to talk about the state of cancer research today and a little bit of my thinking about what we could do at UCSF to contribute to someone giving a talk like this a decade from now saying what would make 97 to 2001 pale in comparison to the decade 2010 to 2020. So uh, in my short experience as an oncologist, I think these five years in terms of product approvals again, that period of time was one of the best ever in oncology. Rituxan was approved by the Food and Drug Administration in 1997, Herceptin in 98, and Gleevec in 2001. And for me, these are three um, products that are worth thinking about. How do you make products like that become available for patients? So when I pushed myself to say, what I think was so good about these three products, um, and why they, for me, define a period of time that was so special in cancer product development. Um, here are some of the attributes that I think um, made me think they were so good, so special. First of all, a, a major unmet need. So these products, each of them, came into a, a, a treatment area that was not just somewhat met, but truly unmet, that there wasn't something that you could tell patients that you had for them. 
biomarker-driven patient selection, um, particularly for Herceptin, was unique and, and at that time unprecedented. And it brought very special challenges, but outcomes that were much better than we had expected. I think good looks like extending survival. It is great to stall a tumor. It can help a patient if you can slow a tumor or shrink a tumor and not markedly decrease the patient's quality of life. But extending survival, for me, is part of what very good looks like and well tolerated. Um, when I first started working on Herceptin at Genentech, one of the amazing things was having moved from having spent a couple of years working on paclitaxel, which many in this audience know doesn't just make you lose all your hair on your head, but your eyebrows and eyelashes. And that experience of patients and their describing to me what it was like um, never left me. So having a medicine that could be powerful and has side effects, very important side effects, but a very different impact on patients' quality of life, I think is part of what good looks like for me. So I know that this audience probably knows quite a bit uh, about uh, Herceptin, so I'm gonna start on my uh, description of what good looks like with Rituxan, um, the first monoclonal antibody approved in the United States for the treatment of cancer. Uh, Rituxan truly was a new and groundbreaking approach to treatment in that um, it was able to harness the body's immune system. And um, one of the most amazing things about uh, developing this antibody approach to lymphoma was something that, again, taught me a lot. It, one of the aspects of product development that I always enjoyed was product safety. And one day when we were developing uh, Rituxan for lymphoma, one of the product safety experts at Genenta came to my office and said, one of our patients has experienced tumor lysis syndrome. We got a report of tumor lysis syndrome in a patient with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and a high level of circulating malignant uh, lymphoma cells. And the patient had a very classic tumor lysis syndrome, rapid breakdown of tumor cells. They had had 90,000 circulating uh, malignant lymphocytes, and the next morning they had 10,000, and they were in renal failure and requiring dialysis. And I asked, was the patient on any chemotherapy? And the answer was no. They received single agent uh, rituximab or rituxan. And I had a discussion with the drug safety expert on whether we thought that this was due to the rituxan therapy, and it certainly seemed related. And before that moment, I personally underestimated the power of treating a cancer with a naked, unarmed antibody and how much tumor cell killing could ensue. Because at the time, in the 90s, we often described antibody therapy as kinder, gentler therapy. Well, there was nothing kind or gentle about causing tumor lysis syndrome. So a, a, quite a remarkable experience to see something that was that powerful um, with a naked antibody. And then Rituxan was special because of its rapid approval and launch. The pivotal trial for Rituxan had 166 patients. Sorry, Deb, it was uncontrolled. You'll have to forgive that. Um, <laughs> it was uncontrolled because the standard therapy for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma at the time was watch and wait. So that was standard to avoid the complications of not very effective chemotherapy. So the total number of patients submitted to FDA was just over 300, and the pivotal trial had 166 patients. So before Rituxan was approved, aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma was curable with chemotherapy in a percentage of patients. But after, there was increased survival demonstrated among patients with aggressive lymphoma in a randomized comparative trial by 23%. The cure rate significantly increased, and one of the most interesting aspects that's still under study is this possibility of turning cancer into a chronic disease. Coming back in and having repeated doses of the antibody to keep the patient in remission. 
And again, because of the absence of rapid emergence of resistance and the tolerability, it was possible to even discuss coming in every six months for repeated doses of antibody. So in many ways for me, thinking about the power of monoclonal antibodies and what's possible for patients with lymphoma, there was before rituxan and there was after rituxan. It changed many of our concepts of what we would get with this type of therapy. Now those concepts changed even more dramatically when less than one year later, Herceptin was approved for HER2 positive uh, metastatic breast cancer. And having just heard the tail end of the last talk, I don't need to tell this audience how important personalized medicine is and targeting a specific mutation is. But I will tell you that having practiced in the community, when I came to work on Herceptin, I had had conversations with patients that sounded like, you have an overexpression of this protein that we know from the work of Dennis Slayman and others decreases your expected survival from an average of seven years in HER2 negative to about three years in HER2 positive. And I had no remedy for that. The outcome of that knowledge was only to make the patient and me more nervous, more anxious about their outcomes and their eventual fate. And so, for me to be able to work on a product that was the answer to the question, what do we do now, when you know that you have a prognostic marker, was really quite dramatic. Herceptu was the first product ever launched with a companion diagnostic, and it took an enormous amount of scrambling. The initial DACO test was late in coming. We had a, a test that could only be used in the lab, not available for commercialization, not scalable, and in a company that had never had a diagnostic approved, we needed to work with that aspect of FDA. And we did it um, uh, in a very MacGyver-like way in our spare time. So the, the rapid FDA approval was due to a large unmet need and patient advocate demands. And Herceptin was also, and I know this was part of the experience at UCSF with patient advocacy, Herceptin was the first product that I experienced in oncology where patient advocates not only drove much of the program, but interacted in ways that initially were incredibly difficult and ended up being ex extremely important with the company, with FDA, and with, most importantly, the patient community in Herceptin's approval. So before, there was no treatment option specific to HER2-positive breast cancer, and it was a rapid death sentence for most women. And after, um, with the adjuvant data, about a 20% difference in disease-free survival at five years and reduced the risk of the cancer returning by 52%. And three years after uh, more than 12,000 patients were studied in adjuvant therapy, 85% of the patients had no tumor recurrence for this most difficult to treat form of breast cancer. So again, for me, the definition of good is completely changed the field and how we thought about treating uh, women with this form of breast cancer. Now, Gleevec is so important, it was on the cover of Time magazine, and it really was the perfect storm of discovery, advocacy, and commitment with a fast FDA approval and a phenomenal success rate. I had a conversation with someone who was thinking about asking Kareem Abdul-Jabbar to do some advocacy on behalf of the University of California, because we're all trying to get the state to give us more money. And the individual who was talking to me said, boy, I'd love to get Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in Sacramento in front of our legislators to talk about how important higher education is in this state. But you know he has leukemia now. And, and I got a smile on my face and I said, no, no, he doesn't have leukemia, he has CML. He should be fine. And I, I, I think that my definition of good is that, that if you heard about someone with CML 15 years ago, you would have the impression, uh-oh, you know, this is really serious and rapidly life-threatening in adult leukemia. But CML treatment was transformed. So before Gleevec, only 30% of patients with CML survived five years after diagnosis and treatments had serious side effects. After, there's a complete hematologic response in 98% of patients and nearly a 90% five-year survival rate in patients. This is what we should be doing. These are the kinds of outcomes we should strive for 
in oncology. So where are we today? I remember telling someone after Herceptin was approved, we're going to do this all the time. Every year we'll have one of these. <laughs> so you know now that if you want a stock tip or a prediction of the future, don't check with me. <laughs> Cancer research today is too slow, too expensive, too inefficient, and too uncertain. I went back and looked for a talk I gave about the timetable for uh, bevacizumab or Avastin, uh, and I tracked it back to the idea, which might not be fair, but the idea, the concept of anti-angiogenesis as first published by Judah Folkman in the New England Journal of Medicine, that was 1971. So 26 years from concept to, to treatment. And I thought, well, maybe this is just historical. I'm looking back at something that happened in the 70s. What about something new, like telomerase? Liz Blackburn and her co-workers topic that uh, just was awarded a Nobel Prize. Well, the identification of telomerase was Christmas 1984, and I think the clinical trials are in phase two today. So when I said, okay, maybe I'm just looking too far back, I don't think it was looking too far back, that's still what we're seeing from identification of a potential target to, again, my benchmark approval so that these products can be available for society. It's too slow. Cancer drugs are too expensive, and the media covers this in cost of cancer drugs to force hard decisions, the unbearable cost of living, rising drug prices hard to swallow, Costly cancer drug offers hope, but also a dilemma. So if we want to change how cancer patients are treated, we need to have access. Patients need to be able to afford and to receive these products. But I don't want to be pessimistic. I think there's glimmers of hope. Um, and I picked four areas that are under study now as examples um, by pulling several people on where are the next magnificent drugs, where are the next products that are going to change cancer. Now I'm not mentioning some that are already approved that are under study that with biomarkers outcomes may change or things may improve in the future, but I think products like BRAF inhibition for selected melanomas is exceptionally exciting. I think that this um, this avenue is both exciting and has the possibility to change therapy for as many as 60% of patients with melanoma and 8% of patients with solid tumors. The systemic hedgehog inhibitor for basal cell carcinoma and medulloblastoma is another targeted therapy that I think is, is nearly like insulin and diabetes. The role of uh, the hedgehog pathway in basal cell carcinoma is so seminal that its mutation leads to Gorlin syndrome, a genetic abnormality that causes congenital basal cell carcinoma. So it's a fundamental driver of this malignancy and some types of medulloblastoma. The ALK inhibitor for patients with selected lung cancers, a very narrow group of patients, only about four to five percent, but it again appears to be a potentially perfect remedy for this type of lung cancer. And, and last but certainly not least, uh, the PARP inhibitors for selected uh, triple negative breast cancers and potentially ovarian cancers as well. I think these are the kinds of products that give me optimism that this approach to cancer therapy, and I would submit the speed along with that, may in fact be changing. So what about the future? What can we do at UCSF, and what can be our role in thinking about that platinum era, the next decade in product development for cancer? So I have some metrics for success. Should be faster, should be cheaper, and, and I think more than either of those, it should be more predictable. It isn't just a problem that only one of 10 or perhaps even less than that, products that go into clinical trials become approved therapies. The problem is we don't know which one in 10 will succeed in the trials. 
we need to understand earlier and with greater confidence what the best ideas are so that we can focus our attention on those best ideas. Here's one of the reasons why we need to do a better job. This is from a, a, a list of products that um, pharma put together. Total cancer drugs in development, 861. Think about the time, effort, patient time and energy, investigator time and energy and money for to study appropriately 861 potential new therapies in cancer. It's overwhelming. It's also exciting. There's a lot that can be done. So with this in mind, with so much substrate, so much great biology, and wanting us to be better than ever before, I had four different areas that I've listed on this slide of how I think we could get to that platinum era in cancer product development. And it starts really with discovery. Um, it, many of the products that I just described have something in common, and that is they're driven primarily by a single pathway. There, there is oncogene addiction. There is something that we can turn off and make a difference. I think we should be incredibly dogged, even if it's a narrow group of patients, to uncover those cancers that are driven primarily by a single pathway. But I don't think it ends there. Most common cancers are complex, and there are multiple signals. But we need technical breakthroughs to enable development. We need to understand how to test more than one product at a time and to do so efficiently in a way that gives us clear signals. We need better surrogates. I think survival is the best outcome measure, but if survival is extended, I'm not willing to wait beyond our lifetimes to know the answer. And more importantly, patients shouldn't wait for us to find the answers. We need to understand particularly what products deserve survival trials with better surrogates for activity earlier on. Very importantly, safety and comparative effectiveness. There's no reason in today's world with electronic medical records and, and newer informational technolo information technology that we shouldn't know what happens to every patient. We need both outcomes and molecular correlates on every cancer patient. Think of the amount of information that we know nothing about on patient outcomes. And I think we should be dogged in asking those questions. There is so much information on safety, efficacy, potential good and potential harm, and we need to know that. And then access. We need to make sure the right product reaches the right patient at the right time and they can afford it. And so this efficiency and understanding when a product is best used in an individual patient is essential. So that's a big list. But I am optimistic. Uh, as I mentioned, my training at UCSF included a two-year sojourn to uh, East Africa in Uganda at the Uganda Cancer Institute. And my expertise was in Kaposi sarcoma. And so I had a, quite a remarkable experience, as did many of my peers, in training at a period of time when the age-adjusted death rate of, in HIV looked like that. But I happily also experienced that. Think of, think of what that would look like if that happened in cancer. And that would really be sweet. You wouldn't have to look real hard to, 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 to see that. So I think what happened in HIV was quite remarkable. I, no one's declaring victory. We still need a vaccine. It still needs to be much better. But that kind of inflection seemed to me in no small part driven by the availability of a surrogate, HIV viral load, an outcome measure, that was readily available, could be measured as early as phase one or preclinically, that said, this is going to be the right product for this patient. And during the course of patient therapy, 
when the virus becomes resistant, it was measurable and one could adjust. So not only did survival change, but the number of product launches also skyrocketed so that there was a menu of choices and patients could have measurements and swap out. And if we had the ability to measure quickly in patients their outcome and adjust, as was done with the HIV analogy, I think we're far more likely to see that wonderful plummet in death rates, as was experienced with HIV. So how does UCSF fit into this? Um, I think we have incredible opportunities at UCSF. I mentioned relentlessly uncovering the key drivers of cancer. I think that's where UCSF shines. This is a place where great science has always been done. But I want to come back to translation. I think we should push ourselves not only to have the best basic science, but to be leaders in novel approaches to translate those drivers into new therapies. Some of what's going on in the breast cancer program for me is what good looks like in terms of challenging ourselves. What are the trial approaches? What is the innovation in how we test products and patients to make it move more quickly and to become more educated and informed about what happens in patients and their outcomes? We should push more translation from the clinic to the lab. Every patient teaches us something. And the best thing about clinical trials is you get to know so much if you're just paying attention. Patients teach us all the time. We just have to be paying attention, looking for it, and seeing if a group of patients has a different outcome and asking ourselves why they have a different outcome. And let me come back to where I started with my own experience. We need, as a university, to help the world define a set of skills. It's a technical expertise and a career path that allows brilliant trainees to show us the way to be more efficient in translation. I don't know the answer to the questions I'm posing. I think they're very hard questions, but I know someone can figure out better ways for us to ask questions about how we best help cancer patients. And that career path, combined with the kind of basic science we do, I think is enabling of something that is far better than anything any of us have seen in our careers. So I'm going to end with what I think the goal is. And I'll come back to the conversation I used to have with patients as a clinical oncologist. For me, the goal is that any patient who hears from their caregiver, you have cancer, expects to live a meaningful life, expects to have the conversation, here's the kind of cancer you have, and in fact, we have something for that. So that's, I think, what we should push ourselves to do for as many cancer patients as possible. And I think UCSF has an unprecedented opportunity given the skills and talent and young, talented trainees that we have at UCSF to contribute. So thank you for listening, and uh, I hope you have a great symposium.